We appreciate your reading that word for us this morning. And you have just seen a classic illustration of intergenerational, really intergenerational. But delighted that we're doing that. And I think it's appropriate for me to at least personally thank the elders, and Matthew, and the worship team for making this kind of uh, reading and, and the intergenerational thing possible every Sunday. I think it's a great idea. I commend you for that. And it's just a sweet moment. I think it's safe to say that virtually everyone here this morning has experienced rejection in one form or another. A job interview that didn't result in your being hired. A promotion within the corporation that you've been serving for several years was given to somebody else. An apology that you offered to someone you offended was not accepted. A relationship that you hoped would grow into something very special didn't respond with similar interest. Years ago, I was a seventh grader living in Fort Collins. Her name was Mary Lou. She was pretty. She lived on a ranch, and I had visions of dating her and fulfilling my ambitions to be a real cowboy. When our eyes met, she smiled. I sensed the best was yet to be. She continued to smile and then walked hand in hand with another boy to the next class. I was shattered. It's not that I didn't expect competition. I didn't expect rejection. Now, I've, that's a silly illustration, and I assure you I'm over it. But the God we love, the God we have come here today to worship, has been experiencing rejection nearly from day one. The very two people that he created, first of all, didn't take no for an answer. And I think that the human race has continued to in be interested in forbidden fruit ever since. Our text today will come from Isaiah. Samuel read part of that for us in a passage. But I want to tell you that Isaiah was sent by God to a divided nation of people. They were already on the cusp of being taken as captives. They would lose their freedom. They would lose everything that was dear to them in the familiar lifestyle of Judah. There was a sinful nation that God was going to punish. They had rejected God. They had accepted the worship of pagan idols. And Isaiah himself was even rejected. He was a spokesman for God but they wouldn't listen to him. Now, the Scriptures don't tell us anything about how the end came for Isaiah. But Jewish tradition, as recorded in some of their encyclopedias, say that Isaiah was sawn in half bodily with a wooden saw by an evil king called Manasseh. The rejection had been very complete in that sense. 
And when Isaiah was writing, was speaking to the people, and these words were being recorded and preserved for us, Isaiah was saying to the people, one, yes, the Lord will bring punishment to you for your evil, but the Lord also will keep his promise. He made a covenant with you long ago, and he will keep that promise. You're not very good at keeping promises. You're not very good at keeping covenants, but the Lord will. And so in Isaiah 53, the prophet describes the rejection of someone who was ignored and discounted as unimportant. And he used language that actually would make us sometimes think of a leper, how a leper would feel with the diseased and wasted body and the loss of society and family. An outcast, alone, disfigured. And yet, the prophet would say, with respect to all of this, that there is something in the promise of God that cannot be ignored. He will not be thwarted in wanting to, to bless you. But while it describes a leper, it also describes a servant. And Isaiah uses the term servant over and over and over in this book talking about the servant, the servant who will come, the servant who will be ignored, the servant who will die for our sins, the servant whose wounds will heal us. Listen to it. He says, who has believed what we've heard? And whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Now a leper would know all of those feelings. Jesus did not have leprosy. The servant of God came but was rejected. And that's what Isaiah is telling these people. He's coming, but he will be rejected just as you are rejecting me as a spokesman for God. He's borne our infirmities, carried our diseases. We've accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the punishment that made us whole. By his bruises we are healed. The description of the rejected lover, the one who came and spoke on behalf of God and the one who had the ability to tell us, yes, he was hated and rejected by people. He had much pain and suffering. People would not even look at him and we didn't even notice him. That's how Jesus would be treated. That's how the servant of God would be treated. And it was happening even in Isaiah's day as a forecast of what's to come. The servant in this passage of Isaiah 53 and others is, of course, Jesus. And Peter picks that up in a passage in the New Testament. Hundreds of years later, an apostle reaches back to those words in Isaiah. People insulted Christ, said Peter, but he did not insult them in return. Christ suffered, but he did not threaten. He let God, the one who judges rightly, take care of him. He carried our sins in his body on the cross. So we would stop living for sin and start living for what is right. And you are healed because of his wounds. Jesus had every right to feel rejected. 
He had every right to know that there was, within his efforts to reach people and to teach them, that some would listen and some would not. And the ones that he was most disappointed about were those who were the leaders of the people themselves, who would not listen. He had every right to feel rejected. And Matthew chapter 23 describes that for us in a, in a very painful way. But before I can tell you what he said, let me give you the background for why he said it. In chapter 23, Jesus finally reached the end of all of what had been the rejection of his word and his efforts with his people, and especially the leaders of the people. He confronted the hypocrisy and the unbelief of the nation's religious leaders. It prompted the strongest message that you will find in Scripture from Jesus. He wanted the people to hear it, but he wanted the leaders also to know that they were the object of his scorn. He said, you leaders are performing your religious activities only to be observed and lauded by others. You love places of honor. You want to be thought of as scholars. You like the titles of rabbi and teacher and father. But titles and positions are not goals in themselves. You need to look at those ranks of authority and responsibility as opportunities to serve, not to be honored to your own ego and satisfaction. He criticized religious leaders for preventing others from coming to him and learning from him. He said, you will will go to the ends of the earth to convert someone to your philosophies, but you will not let them come to me. He criticized the leaders for their long prayers that were intended to impress people with their spirituality. But he said, you're also at the same time as you're giving these ornate and long-winded prayers, you are a, you're missing opportunities to serve some widows who are being oppressed. He criticized the leaders for being too busy with small details. They were majoring on minors. They were not dealing with important matters like justice and mercy and faithfulness. He criticized the leaders for being obsessed with eternal, uh, external cleanliness. He reminded everybody that if you're clean inside, it will show in the outside of your lifestyle. He criticized the leaders for decorating the graves of the past servants of God as though these people were to be honored in some official way. And they whitewashed the grave tombstones and so forth. And Jesus said, you are as hollow and empty as the graves you were whitewashing. You hypocrites. You're saying you would never have done anything like this if you'd been there? In my heart of hearts, I know you are already planning my death. Finally, exhausted and grieving, Jesus looked at the throngs of people about him. And then he looked at the panorama of the city. And he said these words, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, You kill the prophets and stone to death those who are sent to you. Many times I've wanted to gather your people as a hen gathers chicks under her wings. But you did not let me. Now your house will be left completely empty. You will not see me again. Until that time when you will say, God bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, if you've ever raised chickens, and I think Noah would know this, you understand how a mother hen protects her baby chicks. Chicks are preoccupied with new sounds and sights. They have no sense of danger at all. Everything is interesting to them, but they're also easily frightened. 
They respond by instinct to the clucking of the mother. And they come to her in times of fright. Now we respond not by instinct. We will re respond to love. God so loved the world that he gave his son. And we're responding to that. We're responding and we feel secure with him. We're living out a whole new life, a forgiven life because of him. And the scriptures that we read are a form of clucking alerts to us. As God calls to us like a mother hen. I feel it's important to, to recognize that there's a kind of a, 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 a dual role of God being played here. When he chooses to use through his son's words, I would gather you as a hen would gather her chicks under my wings. It's a sort of a masculine and feminine role, and, and wings comes in so many different times. Wings are important motif in the scriptures. They talk about refuge and, and protection. As a, for instance, when the people of Israel, the Hebrew people, were delivered from Egypt, and they were at Mount Sinai, this is, of course, the... The, the, the illustration that Noah would understand best. But the people at Sinai would hear Moses say to them on behalf of God, like an eagle building its nest that flutters over its young, it spreads its wings to catch them and carries them on its feathers. Have you seen any pictures about the aerial nests of eagles when young eagles get too close to the nest and one of them maybe falls over? Have you seen the mother or father eagle swoop down with its wings and catch the little one and bring it back to the nest? a marvelous sight. And that's how God was protecting his people. Moses wanted the people to remember that. That the Lord had been caring for them. That, in, in fact, that every one of you has seen what I did to the people of Egypt. You saw how I carried them out of Egypt as if on eagle's wings and brought you here to me. And the psalmist carry it off. Psalm 36, all people take refuge in the shadow of your wings. All people, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. There's plenty of room under his wings for everybody. He cares for all people. He wants nobody to perish. He wants everyone to come back to the safety of his wings. And you have seen my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy, says David. Reminds me of the lyric of Victor Hugo, who said, Be as a bird in flight, resting on limb so slight, feels it gives way beneath him, yet sings because it has wings. We are given those wings in a sense. We, are, we sing the song, I'll fly away. We're able to fly away from that which would hold us down. The dangers and the oppression and the idiocy and the disease and waste of sin. We're able to fly from that. And someday we will fly totally away into the shadow of his wings. I like the, 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 the dual role of masculine and feminine, whether it's hens gathering the chicks, or as in Luke, for instance, Luke 15, there's a masculine and feminine being portrayed. There's the woman who's searching for a lost coin, a woman. And then there's the shepherd searching for lost sheep. You've got the balance. You have masculinity and you have femininity. Now I hear of a lot about gender sensitive, being gender sensitive these days. 
striking the balance between the sexes, improving the level of appreciation for feminine rights in a male-dominated society. And the vocabulary of our scriptures are even caught up in this. Sometimes you'll find variations in, in the scriptures that talk about words. Instead of man, it's mankind. Instead of brother, it's brethren. Instead, of, or even brothers and sisters. Nothing wrong with that. Except for one scholar years ago who said we ought to probably word our prayers to God our mother. Well, he's, has a, God has a motherly instinct and a motherly care for us. But I find no model for that. Even in the prayers of Jesus, they were addressed to his father. And so I think we would not make that change to accommodate the, the times. And my purpose in, the, in saying all of this isn't to argue the gender issues. I just want us to see in Jesus his struggles, his challenges that easily resonate as much for manhood as womanhood. God knows how to adapt himself to all of us. In fact, it's important to remember that the sin problem and the sin remedy are both gender neutral. In other words, God is neither feminine nor masculine. He uses gender images to disclose himself to us, to accommodate our, our need to understand who he is, that he cares and is concerned for us in a motherly instinct, and yet he commands and protects us as a virulent man, so to speak. The images are feminine and masculine just to accommodate us. Now, in the Matthew 23 text, we heard Jesus say those things as a tender and grieving picture of one who bemoaned the rejection of his own people. He was saying goodbye to them. He was saying, I won't be back to preach in your temple in synagogues anymore. And 40 years later, when the Roman armies swept into Palestine, they reduced Jerusalem to rubble. And Jesus, in his own heart of hearts, was sensing that that was going to happen. He knew they would be hunted and killed and scattered like animals. And he was feeling a mother's pain and anguish for lost children. He was lamenting the dis not dement he wasn't lamenting the destruction of the temple. He was lamenting the people who would be unwilling to come to him for their protection, forgiveness, and direction and strength. When Jesus was named Emmanuel, God with us, it was an important way for him, God to say, "I will create you as a very intimate member of my family." You will be brothers and sisters. You will be sons and daughters. You will be my children. And Jesus makes all of that possible. And God is on guard every time for his children. And we need to understand that when we reach situations that are desperate and are about to shatter our lives because of something that grieves us and disappoints us and rejects us, we need to remember God knows and he cares and he will preserve. Under his wings, we're rescued from many fears and dangers and trying to figure out life on our own and trusting in things that are all going to pass away anyway. He's rescuing us from playing with our toys of diversion and self-gratification. But how much longer? How much longer will the Lord do this? How much longer can a heavenly father 
have motherly concern for us and continue to be rejected. That's why we're here today is to enforce and reinforce in each other the need to reach out to people who do not have that hope, that security. To reject the Lord's love and security is like a mother's pain for lost children who will not come for forgiveness and direction. Now, how much longer can it happen? How much longer will a person refuse light and prefer darkness? You know, that's meaning when we say lost, it's not because sin has no remedy. It's because we reject the remedy. That's really lost. And the Lord doesn't want that. And he proved it when he allowed people to nail his son to the cross. He proves it every day when he comes to speak to us and to share with us his word, clucking to us to come under his wings for protection. As you grow in faith, you will be closer to those wings than you ever were before. And you will know that whatever else happens in this world, no one will separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's what will happen when one believes and is buried by baptism into Christ and raised in the newness of life, carried by the wings of love. Is that your will today? Would you do that? Can we pray together for a need for strengthening what has been shattering at your life? Then let's do that too. And that's why we sing as we stand together and sing this song. Please come. Please come.